Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Gresham College. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the emeritus professors, a fellow and a trustee, and it's my pleasure to be giving tonight's lecture, Risk Equality and Opportunity, the Rules of Government Finance. When our previous registrar, Barbara Anderson, in her stylish way, put this lecture title in the program, she included a circumflex over the O in roll. Cambridge University is now emphatic uh, that there is no circumflex, but Barbara's edit prompted me to try and look for what silent letters the French had dropped. And the etymological chain seems to start with the Latin rotolus, a rolled parchment which included actors' scripts, and via the various uh, vulgar Latin rolus and French uses and multiple spellings, we move to a single L and the modern roll without a circumflex. But the point is that tonight is about acting. We're going to be looking tonight at the state as an actor in finance and what roles can it take. So as we say in commerce to business. What's in store? Well, a number of friends were expecting a who, what, where, when, why, how on taxation. Who, the evil grasping hand of the state, what, crazy taxation, where, far too many places, why, government's overspending and underdelivering, and when, it'll never change. But I already gave a lecture on corporation tax and income tax, and probably the radical tax policy that would work best in the long term is to refocus on land taxes, but in that lecture I set out the basic tenets of a still radical medium-term tax policy as flat taxes based on consumption, guaranteed minimum income, eliminating the fiction of corporation tax, and possibly letting people vote their taxes or a percentage of tax expenditure. That said, I do sympathize with Alistair Darling, who on a BBC programs earlier this, uh, late last year said, if someone can think of a popular tax, they should phone up and let us know. So not tax tonight. Previously at Gresham College, we've also discussed the size of the state. UK government, where tax is 39% of GDP, and spending is over 47% of GDP, uh, the state has become an enormous actor. By way of comparison, back in 1900, government spending was only 12% of GDP. Now, societal finance today is a rich mix where the quick public-private sector divide is dangerously simplistic, and we have the richer offerings of philanthropy, the third or voluntary sector, social enterprise, charities. I thought I'd quote Julia Unwin, chief executive of the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, who spoke here earlier this year, for a bit of balance. But what we also know in our hearts is that when we look at some of the big changes in our society, the emancipation of women, the creation of the NHS, the development of a viable transport infrastructure, the introduction of national insurance, and a system of universal social security, the drive to improve public health, the massive post-war housing boom, Democracy has been important, but money too has spoken. The state has had its way, but so too has the market, and historians and political analysts can debate in detail which came first and which allowed change, but we, the spectators of social change, know that there are two ways to change the world. One is by being elected, and the other is by having a lot of money. But we're not going to talk size tonight. And we could talk forever about numerous ways in which the process of government affects us. What do we mean by consultation? How is scientific evidence used by government? How does the nature of government procurement affect industry structures? And we've previously talked, uh, touched on the complexity of managing government. Milton Friedman sardonically noted, if you put the federal government in charge of the Sahara Desert in five years, there'd be a shortage of sand. But not management tonight. In a popular book, Felix Dennis remarks, keeping costs down is vital in any business except government. How I wish I owned a government. But we're not going to talk about expenditure tonight. So not government tax, size, management, or waste. With such a leviathan of a subject, I want to explore the how of government finance. What are the financial mechanisms government can use to achieve its outcomes? I hope to leave you with a framework of 13 outcomes and types of government finance. Don't worry, I intend to build it up slowly so that hopefully you can remember it. 
I'll give you this peak just now, but we'll build back up to it at the end. And from this, we shall deduce five roles for the actor of government. Actor as benefactor, enterprise, guarantor, investor, and sorcerer's apprentice. Too often, we look at government finance in the way of a household, a combination of Dickens and Thatcher. Lady Thatcher's any woman who understands the problems of running a home will be nearer to understanding the problems of running a country. Dickens, uh, Macabre in David Copperfield, annual income 20 pounds, annual expenditure 19 pounds and six, result happiness, annual income 20 pounds, annual expenditure 20 pounds ought and six, result misery. This cash approach is too simplistic, not least because government has a special position and can do a lot of things a household can't, though that doesn't mean it has to, nor that Dickens and Thatcher aren't correct in the long run. Lady Thatcher also said, the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. But how can we achieve social goals without being dangerously profligate? It's not just about spending. We lack a handy taxonomy for the various government finance mechanisms available and a way of aligning them with objectives. Anyway, to build our framework, we first need to explore the two axes. The first axis is that of possible and desirable outcomes. We explored this axis back in 2008 when I presented some research into evidence of worth. And there we postulated four generic outcomes. Firstly, on the left, expanding frontiers to solve a problem. For example, developing new drugs, which might cure and or prevent disease, or perhaps something as exotic as an anti-meteor protection system. The second black blob is about changing systems to develop markets or to release resources, for example, the introduction of cap and trade carbon markets, or the concepts of paperless government. The third blob is about the actual delivery of services to address the immediate need, for example, primary education or health. And the fourth on the far right is about building a community to help people deal with problems through communal activity. This may sound big society, but it has paid dividends in the past. For example, vigilance against terrorism, tidy country campaigns, anti-drink driving and anti-smoking social influence messages. The diagram emphasizes that we move from high reward and high risk on the left to low reward and low risk on the right. Activities involved in expanding frontiers, such as finding a cure for a killer disease, will probably result in high reward or high risk. You either spend lots of money and cure the disease, or you spend lots of money but fail. Middling outcomes are unlikely, and this type of activity is often best analyzed financially as an option. Activities involved in changing systems, the second blob, are also relatively high risk and or high reward. For example, the initial introductions of universal vaccination. Service delivery, the third one, involves lower risk, but also lower reward activities than expanding frontiers or changing systems. And these responses are most amenable to things like cost-benefit analysis. It is very difficult to define objectives and prove outcomes from communitarian activities. Volunteers or activists are often a mixture of supporters and beneficiaries, or both. Communitarian activities, therefore, tend to be relatively low risk and low reward and are best evaluated by seeing whether people want to belong. Now, many activities fall into more than one of the above categories. Indeed, some organizations, such as One Charity for the Blind, we know, clearly perceive themselves to undertake activities in all four categories. Expanding frontiers by conducting research into blindness, changing systems by lobbying for changes in legislation about blind people, service delivery where they actually provide goods and services to the blind, and communitarian, promoting a sense of belonging. You're not alone. There are other blind people out there. It is clear the government does all these things from sponsoring research to developing new policies, to delivering services, to trying to organize communities. We could provide a lot of comparisons with other countries showing that the scale of government varies widely across the world and that people and governments arrive at a whole variety of different outcomes. The second axis starts to distinguish success measures. And we'll pick on three, risk control, reward enhancement, and volatility reduction. 
again, we explored an earlier version of this slide back in 2006, and we laid out three generic strategic activities. We started with the premise that we wanted to do something about a problem. Imagine we're a government looking at the dotted line of probable outcomes. At this moment, we could have an outcome we value at 50 on average, but things could range from minus 175 to 250. To move to the more attractive solid line to the right, shape A, there are three things we can do. The first is risk control. We eliminate particularly adverse outcomes. We chop off the left half. We perhaps make our worst case minus 80. The second generic activity is reward enhancement. We move the curve towards shape A. We make the average upside much better, perhaps an average of 100, with potential returns up to even 300. But finally, and more subtly, the third generic activity is three, to reduce volatility. We can deliver more consistently and thus tighten the range of possibilities. Some actions that increase costs are still good financial bets if they reduce volatility. One example might be national defense. Do we really want to have a country that's vulnerable? All three activities, risk control, reward enhancement, and volatility reduction, combine in this slide to help from a starting range of minus 175 to plus 250 with a mean of 50 to a range of minus 30 to plus 275 with a mean of 100 and a much higher likelihood of hitting that mean. This slide emphasizes one of the classic debates on the role of government, equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome. We might all agree to join forces to avert disaster through risk control, but we are often divided on whether to enhance rewards or reduce volatility. Equality of opportunity proponents are quite happy to spend some government monies to increase opportunities, i.e. shape A, Equality of outcome supporters typically want to spend money to reduce the volatility of outcome, shape B. It's the Lottery of Life Brigade favoring shape A against the Postcode Lottery Brigade favoring shape B. Well, when we combine the two axes, we create this 12-part taxonomy of outcomes. The more alert among you may be getting a bit panicky about time. You've seen a speaker go through 12 points in turn, and I warned you I had 13. Uh, but I'll whiz through the first six objectives of government finance to try and stay on track. Communitarian outcomes are those with less risk and less reward. For example, from bottom to top, one, communitarian welfare, the provision of basic food, shelter, and emergency health. Two, things that deal with community cohesion, parks, libraries, museums, and other shared cultural resources. Three, we talk about communitarian happiness, special celebrations and events. Might I pick out the Queen's Jubilee and Olympics in this past year? As Juvenal termed it, panem e chirkensis, bread and games. To a large degree, these three outcomes are about spending money to reach acceptable social norms. All of these outcomes are typically expenditure-based and all are tough to measure. This communitarian column constitutes our first role for the government actor that of benefactor. John Adams said, upon this point, all speculative politicians will agree that the happiness of society is the end of government, as all divines and moral philosophers will agree that the happiness of the individual is the end of man. Perhaps it's a little surprise that governments around the world are trying harder and harder these days to measure things like happiness to prove that this money is well spent. Focusing on the communitarian leads to viewing government as a big, cuddly sugar daddy or an overgrown village community chest. It pays for the poor, keeps up the public spaces, and throws a fate once a year. Here, government finance takes the tithe and spends it. Though, as my friend Richard Titchener says somewhat caustically, if you had a community, you wouldn't need a community center. We'll turn to semi-coercive communities a bit later. The second set of three outcomes tends to occupy a lot of pub and dinner party conversation about the role of government, again from bottom to top. Four, we look at the service delivery of benefits, disability and unemployment, catching people in the safety net they are owed as opposed to the presumed charity of welfare in the earlier slide. 
The fifth area is the service delivery of quality. These are the direct delivery of services such as education, health, roads, post. But in earlier times and other governments outside the UK, water, oil, coal, gas, or telecommunications. The sixth box is enhancement, uh, service delivery of improvements and amenities above and beyond basic communitarian cohesion. Opera houses, millennium domes. These three outcomes dominate pub chats because people differ on which ones should or shouldn't be done by the state. Ideologically, many people conclude that they should be left to the market, others that they should be owned by the state. And we have changed our minds at many points in the past, and probably the future, about who is responsible for these utilities or public goods, and who should reap the rewards, if any, from providing them. These can be charged services, or charged but subsidized. Service delivery outcomes are where economy, efficiency, and effectiveness measures can be more readily applied, unlike the communitarian outcomes, leading to even richer, uh, if richer equals more heated, uh, discussions in the pub. So this service delivery column constitutes our second role for the government actor, that of an enterprise undertaking direct work. Focusing on service delivery, we tend to compare government with either business or the military, or a bit of both combined. Our civil servants, though perhaps calling them servants all the time, may well explain why a few are not so civil, are there to be judged through the eyes of a customer or an efficiency-obsessed management consultant. One of the first things people note in practice is that state enterprises often lack competitors. State provisions shouldn't necessarily mean uncompetitive provision, and there is a significant body of evidence showing that competition can help to manage state enterprises better. Even so, government enterprises are financially different from business enterprises. First, business enterprises use accruals accounting. And politicians are like anyone else. They respond to the numbers they have. Government accountants typically use cash accounting or something quite close. Cash accounting ignores long-term liabilities. You think you're in the black, but in reality, you're just building up future crises. Second, businesses have balance sheets. Since the 1990s, significant efforts in the social, environmental, and economic sciences, as well as within governmental and supranational institutions, have centered on how to complement well-established national account indicators, particularly GDP, gross domestic product. Attention has focused on how well-being can be measured in a comprehensive sense that captures the social, environmental, and economic dimensions which feed into it. Natural capital models try to create a balance sheet for government to produce better long-term decisions. Some indicators, for instance, education and health, can be used to assess subjective well-being, while people's perceptions of happiness, again, might measure subjective well-being. A big concern here is the appropriate unit of measurement for the different types of capital and the subsequent comparability of these units. For example, the use of money as a single unit is problematic given the lack of market values or established indirect valuation techniques for some forms of capital. Equally, there is an ethical debate underlying the principle of measuring capital stocks and flows, treating nature as just another form of capital, as though humans are indifferent to its existence as long as their well-being is otherwise assured. Under this theory, well-being supposedly arises from the presence of key capital stocks and the flow of benefits or goods and services that these provide to society. The so-called capital stock model identifies four types of capital that contribute to well-being. The first is physical capital, assets that are used to produce goods and services, machines, factories, buildings, infrastructure. The second is natural capital, the environment, including natural resources. The third is human capital, the health and productive potential of the people, including their levels of education. And the fourth is social capital, the social networks and institutions that support an efficient, cohesive, and functioning society. Things like norms and trust and laws. Now, the degree of substitutability between these different types of capital is contentious. 
Financial capital is often cited as a fifth type of capital, stocks, bonds, deposits, though there is debate as to whether it should stand alone or be viewed as a form of social capital or as the means of conversion between one form of capital and another. Because certain benefits are essential to life, clean water, a stable climate, there are also difficulties in defining critical thresholds for each type of capital beyond which it should not be depleted or degraded. Whether these positive levels of well-being can be sustained over time depends on whether these capital stocks are maintained and can be passed on to future generations. Now, economics is about maximizing well-being and allocating resources under conditions of scarcity. Due to population growth, the whole planet faces a resource scarcity problem. Now, more resource scarcity problems may create a boom for economists, but a balance sheet approach doesn't work without ownership. Ownership of every square centimeter of the planet and every productive resource is the likely outcome of this excessive population growth. And one disturbing consequence of having everything on the balance sheet is that a, a bit like the UK government's appropriation of Trustee Savings Bank back in 1984, so that it could privatize it in 1986, there's increasingly the presumption that public goods are or should be government goods. Don't leave anything lying around in a public space. This is a particularly disturbing trend in the UK today regarding corporation tax. We have a set of tax laws, but then go around for a second bite at taxation in the court of public opinion vulnerability. One of the things that made the Magna Carta so important was the practical stubborn insistence on applying the feudal principle of contract to a ruler. The presumption of government ownership in the first instance puts us in danger of being more Russian than English, with property rights emanating from the ruler rather than contractually provided from the people, as Richard Pipes contrasted so well in his book, Property and Freedom, back in 1999. Well, six down, that wasn't so bad. Now we turn to the ones that need a bit more explanation. This lecture was partially inspired by a wonderful speech that Mary McAleese, the President of Ireland, made in Dublin in 2010. It was about insurance. The certainty and confidence that insurance provision brings to all our daily lives, whether business or personal, enables us to breathe more easily, to find the confidence to let innovation flourish, and to engage with the present and the future, chastened by the past, but not allowing the fear of the possible to paralyze us in the present. Now, while her wonderful evocation should put thousands of insurance marketing people to shame, it raises an, analog an interesting analogy of government as insurer. It is here that our taxonomy starts to stretch our imagination, and we can provide some interesting examples tonight of using finance just beyond taxing and spending. So we'll turn to box seven, changing systems prevention. John Locke was not as sunny as John Adams or Mary McAleese. He wrote, government has no other end but the preservation of property. Following the 10th of April 1992 bombing, which devastated the Baltic Exchange for shipping, insurers withdrew cover for acts of terrorism. In response, the UK government rapidly formed a new government reinsurer called Pool Re, Pool Reinsurance. At the moment, insurers in the UK can reinsure liabilities from terrorism with pool re, typically in excess of the first 75 million pounds. A pool re member's retention is proportionate to their participation in the scheme. Pool re was emulated by the United States after 9-11. Pool re has been particularly well run over 20 years, remaining in significant surplus and supporting a broad property market. It was set up with the aim of attracting other reinsurers into the market, at which it has also been successful. Pool Re is an example of the government spending virtually nothing, but achieving a lot through finance by making a market reappear where it had dried up. This reinsurance idea can be extended. For example, the government wants the UK to be free of cybercrime. Cybercrime insurance is also a dry market where it is hard to get significant risks underwritten. Related cyber terrorism, for example, state-sponsored terrorism, insurance for that doesn't exist. Now, cybercrime does exist, though, and it hurts financially, 
I would contend partly because it's difficult to insure. I would deem cybercrime to be under control when I can buy normal insurance after I've done what an insurer tells me to do to, to get that protection, just like home insurance against burglary or fire. One outstanding proposal from Long Finance is a government cyber reinsurer, cyber re, just like pool re, where government helps the insurance industry handle the extreme losses of cyber crime. We've also long had things like export guarantee schemes, and there are other suggestions, such as pension indemnity insurance, advocated by Con Keating to make defined benefit pensions viable again. These are all forms of insurance that could be offered by the state. Another is to insure overseas student fees against a UK university default in order to bring student business to the UK. Brendan Greeley, in an article uh, for Bloomberg, wrote, you could think of politicians as underwriters. They must compare the probabilities of low frequency events, weighing the risk of a downturn against a sovereign default or of Chinese imperial ambition against more small wars in the Middle East or of climate change against the cost of regulation. Turning to box eight, changing system standards. Previously at Gresham College, in 2006, we discussed how standard markets constitute a free market response to regulation. Governments have always had a role in standards, but standards markets often work so successfully that they are almost unnoticed. We have standards in science, laboratories, calibration, testing, product conformance, manufacturing, parts, components, health and safety, fire, food, working practices, ICT, electrical specifications, transmission formats, global positioning systems, quality standards, design, production, installation, inspection, and environmental, social, and ethical standards, fishing, forestry, trade, child labor. Whole industries, oil and gas, shipping, aviation, base their safety on a combination of standards and assessment combined with regulation. What distinguishes standards markets from regulation is that there is competition in choice in who audits you against the standard. While the process of developing and implementing standards can be mind-numbingly boring, standards, rather than regulation, can evolve. In health, the UK government is behind clinical standards that take the patient into account. In the Green Deal, the government is using standards to certify suppliers. Across Europe, the EU is piloting an environmental technologies verification framework for new environmental products or processes in waste, materials, and energy, using standards markets to validate the claims. In financial terms, some regulations set standards, such as minimum wages, Another approach to changing systems using finance is taxation or tolls. By trying to set a new cost standard, often internalizing an externality, governments try to change behavior. Vice taxes on cigarettes or alcohol are good examples, as well as the emerging areas such as fat taxes, rescinded recently in Denmark as a tariff on saturated fats, but introduced as a trans fat ban in New York City. The ninth box is about changing systems in terms of transforming things. This is quite an exciting area with lots of new products. The basic idea here is to ensure reward, a mirror of ensuring risk. Achievement funding, if you will. This is not new. For example, in order to promote the transformation of lighting, from 1749 to 1824, the UK government provided whaling bounties, uh, 40 shillings a ton, on a 330-ton vessel, which gave about three to six months of fitting out risk cover. Today, we have similar bounties with feed-in tariffs for electricity. One recent novel example of achievement funding began in Monterey Bay in 2005, PACE, Property Assessed Clean Energy Bonds. These are there to finance energy savings, for example, putting photovoltaic, cell, photovoltaic cells on your rooftop. Here, municipal governments offer a specific bond to investors and then loan the money raised to consumers and businesses to put towards an energy retrofit. Nearly 30 states have passed enabling PACE legislation in the last seven years. Another example of transformational products that ensure reward are social impact bonds. 
public sector commissioners commit to pay for significant improvement in outcomes for a designated social group. Some high profile examples include reductions in prisoner reoffending rates out in Wales, the number of people being admitted to hospital, drug rehabilitation, and children's adoption. So this entire column here constitutes our third role for the government actor, that of guarantor. I would argue that pensions fully provided by the state fall into service delivery, but when guaranteed, they fall into our changing systems prevention category. In this category, the government either guarantees that an outcome is ensured, or standards and externality costs will be applied, or that the government will pay for success. One of the interesting problems in this column is hypothecation. Hypothecation is the allocation of revenue raised by a tax or income raised for a specified purpose to designated expenditure or a designated fund. Historically, hypothecation rarely works. Governments find ways to circumvent the designated funds to get at the goodies inside. In the United States, designated road funds are a constant source of contention. In the UK, we can look at the fact that national insurance has become just another tax rather than a designated fund for retirement. However, the failure of hypothecation raises an interesting contrast with government's traditional response to insurance suggestions it doesn't wish to pursue. Government typically responds that these insurance suggestions would raise a contingent liability on the government's balance sheets. A contrary response is that many of these outcomes, cybercrime or defunct pensions, for example, will wind up on the government balance sheet if they occur. So insurance suggestions are good ways of using finance to make markets move outcomes in the right direction. In practice, the government supplies contingent liability through, through a variety of policies and interventions, including the conduct of monetary policy, the provision of deposit insurance, the occasional bailout of commercial banks, investment banks, pension funds, and other institutions, also a whole range of social insurance programs, unemployment insurance and social security, and of implicit catastrophe, earthquakes, nuclear accidents. All these play an important part in influencing the amount of aggregate liquidity in the economy. An interesting point arises when you contrast commercial and government approaches to insurance. A commercial approach by insurers works on risk selection. There are a whole bunch of risks in the outside world that can't be insured or insured for a reasonable cost, so risk control is the dominant approach. Once risk can be transferred, people hedge, typically via derivatives, and finally, if risk can be pooled, then people use insurance. Unlike an insurance company, a national government cannot actually avoid any particular, particular category of risk. Therefore, all exposures in the topmost region with high expected severities, whether associated with low or high expected frequencies, must be accepted, albeit reluctantly in many cases by the government. However, because of the political difficulty associated with setting aside sufficient financial reserves for these costliest of exposures, the government will tend to address them only as they occur on a pay-as-you-go basis. In the bottommost region, the government can take advantage of the likely presence of many similar and uncorrelated claims with low expected severities. So this region is much like the corresponding region for insurance companies. Here the government sets aside formal reserves for various social insurance programs. In the middle region, the government typically tries its best to avoid these risks by encouraging firms and individuals to rely on their own private insurance products, but naturally does not always succeed. Government's special role means it helps to create liquidity throughout the country, and liquidity its price discovery, which should engender more rational capital allocation. We turn now to our final column, Expanding Frontiers. Again, starting at the bottom, Expanding Frontiers Research. One of the great, often unnoticed contrasts between much government research and much commercial research is that government research tends to be about reducing risks, while commercial research tends to be about gaining rewards. 
This may seem a bit odd, given that much commercial research is also about eliminating risk, for example, reducing the, the effects of disease, but the system is one of reward, a pharmaceutical company getting paid to reduce the effects of the disease. Government researchers like to have a known problem, defeat cancer, defend the nation, where the commercial structures are irrelevant. Here we have government working to manage a research portfolio. In box 11, expanding frontiers policies, governments do find it hard to prove that they are committed to policies. One approach to proving that they're committed on inflation has been to issue bonds that are linked to inflation targets. The first time principal and interest on a bond were linked to the price of a basket of goods was in 1780 in the state of Massachusetts. The Massachusetts basket included corn, beef, wool, and leather. But inflation-linked bonds were not commonly issued until the 1980s, in fact, being popularized in 1981 in the United Kingdom. Growth, however, has been strong. In 2009, inflation-linked bonds represented 9% of worldwide outstanding sovereign debt. Another type of bond are public performance bonds. These are bonds whose funds are for general expenditure on roads, hospitals, and schools, but whose payment terms are tied to successful policy outcomes. They are a simple extension of inflation linked, but just incorporating other targets. Previously at Gresham College, we've explored a simple, almost subversive proposal on climate change finance, index-linked carbon bonds. An index-linked carbon bond is a government-issued bond where interest payments are linked to a carbon target say the level of feed-in tariffs for renewable energy, emission certificate prices, or actual greenhouse gas emissions of the country. But the proceeds of the bond are for general expenditure, roads and schools and hospitals. It's not a green bond. An investor in an index-linked carbon bond receives an excess return if the issuing country's targets are not met. For example, an extra 10 percentage points of interest on the bond for each percentage point the government is below its renewable use targets. A related approach might also work for forestry bonds for countries trying to prove that they will change their systems to work against deforestation. Again, the bond pays more if the country fails to meet its forestation targets. There are obvious extensions in areas such as foreign investors looking at inward investment who need to rely on government policy promises, say on policing, education, or worker health. If governments tell the truth about their policy commitments, they get cheap money. If governments are not committed, they pay. Investors can hedge product, projects or technologies that support a policy because if the government's stated future fails to arrive, the issuing government winds up paying investors higher interest rates on government debt. And our final box is about expanding frontiers, invention. Perhaps I should have uh, used this photo under enterprise, but this is our Star Trek to boldly go where no man has gone before. While this sounds exciting, and government rhetoric likes to claim it has been behind many new inventions, think Al Gore and the information superhighway, uh, the truth is that government is rather good at claiming credit, and rather poor at actually inventing. In some sense, that's fine. A bureaucratic mechanism is not conducive to invention. I might prefer to give my money to a philanthropic actor who is more likely to spend on risky ventures. Governments do tend to crow about co-investment here. Various enterprise funds, regional development funds, or state development banks. But there are other means. At one point, as a director of an agency responsible for approximately 40% of UK government R&D, I asked a simple question. Have we learned a lot this year? And the answer was always, sure, lots. To which my response was, then why are we spending more than 99% of our research monies the way we did last year? Where's the learning? Governments have a legitimate need to diversify our opportunities, yet government processes encourage concentration. Some of the interesting financial approaches for invention outcomes include prizes and awards. The USA's Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency is famous for its challenges in robotics or self-guided vehicles. I sometimes wonder about carving out a substantial percentage of research monies just for lotteries. Basically set a very low bar for an application, just high enough to ensure that the person or organization has something of substance to do and has filled out a form. State the range of awards on offer, 
we will award two half million pounders, 10 100,000 pounders, and 50 25,000 pound grants, and then simply use a lottery. No experts. It's clear what's needed to win. The decisions on effort are on the side of the applicant. It would increase research diversity, and it would decrease compliance cost. This is government as a kinnick. To the kinnick, the act of analysis, a cynical task, is destructive, whereas the act of existence is creative. A cynical or cheeky government doesn't know what is needed or how to do it, but proudly supports your right to do something about it. A cynic is a person who holds that by being what you are, you achieve what you seek. So government provides the conditions for success, but not the means. Well, we end our dirty dozen on government as an investor thinking about portfolios. And no, I'm not a new laborite rephrasing all expenditure as investment. Uh, nor does this make, make government itself a good investment. First, it's a bit like having a dual-class share structure. One group do the voting, another stump up the cash. Uh, second, investment begs the question of what type. State-directed capitalism is a rising trend that The Economist terms a new kind of hybrid corporation backed by the state but behaving like a private sector multinational. These BMS raise concerns about lack of competition, impediments to free trade, corruption, and the use of force. Third, government as investor has a poor track record around the world, as well as in the UK. Overall, these mechanisms have not proven to be that efficient or effective or even inventive. It is a long argument to explain how some government investment drives multiples of private investment away. But every time we've had a program in aerospace, electronics, computing, regional development, we've killed that sector. As The Economist notes, industrial policy requires disinterested, benevolent policymakers who can do it well. Unfortunately, they do not yet have a recipe for how such policymakers can be created. Which leads us nicely uh, to our 13th outcome, money itself. Before we discuss money, we need to define community, a group of people who are indebted to one another. Now, there are many ways to track indebtedness, memory, simple obligation counts, or chit systems. If our community obliges you to do a good deed for your neighbor, you may use a simple counting approach. But as a community grows larger, members of the community may wish to trade these debts. And when these debts are traded independently, a form of money arises to manage indebtedness around the community. So does government make us a community? Back in 1919, Max Weber wrote, a compulsory political association with continuous organization will be called a state if and insofar as its administrative staff successfully upholds a claim to the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force in the enforcement of its order. Robert Nozick's Anarchy, State, and Utopia, along with John Rawls's A Theory of Justice, dominated the late 20th century social and political analytical philosophical debates. Rawls promoted liberal egalitarianism, while Nozick challenged the legitimacy of anything more than a simple libertarian state. Governments can, and do, undertake many different activities around the world, but this monopoly of force or violence is a constant. Of course, almost immediately after establishing such a monopoly, a government needs to raise resources. And raising resources is frequently done through taxation. Fiat currency is let there be money created by the state whose value is determined by legal means. And typically, these legal means have been that the money is acceptable for the payment of taxes. Fiat currency has been the dominant form of money for the past few centuries. As the New Economics Foundation points out, Money is really nothing more than a promise to pay. However, what distinguishes money from pure credit, or say an IOU note, is its general acceptability. Promises to pay that are accepted as tax will tend to be the most widely accepted for private debts and exchanges, as almost everyone needs to make regular tax payments. What we call money is really just circulating prepaid tax chits. So government does form a semi-coercive community called a nation. If you don't believe the coercion or force are quite close to the surface, just try ringing 
HM Revenue and Customs tomorrow and saying, I don't quite feel like a member of the British community this year and would like to forego my taxes for a while. You would fairly quickly join a community that uses iron bars for curtains and eats rather mediocre communal meals. Further, government monopolization of community crowds out the multiplicity of other communities we might join. So quite related to this monopoly on force, governments fairly quickly establish a monopoly on money as well, or establish a central bank with a monopoly on the use of tax debts as money. And money gives government finance the ultimate tool. First, money underpins all national finance. In cooperation with banks using fractional reserve lending, governments determine how much trust there is in society. Second, governments can print financial impact when needed. Through inflation, governments can tax up to a point relatively unnoticed. And third, money gives governments control of the transfers of value among generations. While we talk about liquidity crises and financial crises, I might argue that we in the West are experiencing more subtle monetary crises and I hope that we don't have to deploy the strategic problem of solving approach used by the Microsoft operating system. Control, Alt, Delete to reboot. Or as the economist Buttonwood column concluded, creditors have been more patient with democratic governments than with other regimes, probably because the risk of abrupt changes of policy, like the repudiation of Tsarist debts by Russia in 1917, are reduced. But this has postponed the crunch point rather than eliminated it and allowed stable democracies to accumulate higher debt relative to their GDP than many more volatile countries ever achieved. Governments can, as Madison suggested, confiscate the wealth of domestic creditors via inflation, taxes, or default. But however often they vote, democracies cannot make foreign lenders extend credit. That harsh truth is now being discovered. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe wrote the Sorcerer's Apprentice poem back in 1797. For governments, in Garbo Goethe, fiat money is die Geister die ich rief, the spirits that I called. And this is our fifth and final role for government, and a frightening one. Democracies do not really understand their own monetary systems based on trading tax debts within a semi-coercive community nor do governments. They have invoked magic they do not understand and cannot yet control. As Jean-Claude Trichet, president of the ECB before Mario Draghi remarked, the fact that markets are dysfunctional is, in our opinion, the responsibility of governments. They are issuing their own securities. They have the responsibility for the credibility of their own securities. Or as Anthony Peters of Swiss Invest points out about deficit spending, we know that tax and spend doesn't work, and we can be fairly sure that spend and tax works even less. That said, some governments, particularly in Asia, are exploring ways of using their monetary base to create liquidity that is not based solely on future tax obligations. So am I guilty of encouraging yet more innovation in government finance, an area already so full of inventive tricks that we have no idea if we can meet our pension or health obligations. We could point to the debacle of private finance initiatives or public-private partnerships as an example of government financial innovation gone mad, a government version of collateralized debt obligations, CDOs. Perhaps, but I feel that we need to understand all the ways we can use government finance before we act, and this taxonomy of 12 ways plus the monetary system itself may help us to use government finance more wisely. But of all the methods, the monetary system is the one that the apprentice least understands. Really, a coin is just a promise, and the only real limit to the amount of money we produce is how many promises we wish to make to one another and what sort. As David Graeber says, under existing arrangements, of course, there are all sorts of other artificial limits over who is legally allowed to issue such promises, or determines what kind of promises have what sort of comparative weight. It is such arrangements that allow us to pretend that money is some kind of physical substance, that debts are not simply promises, which would mean that a government's promise to pay investors at a certain rate of interest has no greater moral standard 
than, say, their promise to allow workers to retire at a certain age or not to destroy the planet. David Bolat uh, mused with me as to whether current debates about government are becoming more vicious because people are locked into evaluations that are deontologically driven. That is, they use normative ethics and evaluate whether or not an action is moral based on whether or not it follows a set of rules. And that these deontological positions conflict with utilitarian analysis. So for example, a belief in small government and low taxes prescribes certain state actions. Or a belief in communitarian welfare or redistribution prescribes expenditure over other means of achieving social goals. Now the US presidential campaign featured quite a bit of deontological jousting between Romney and Obama about the role of government. When, when Obama said in July uh, this year, if you were successful, somebody along the line gave you some help. There was a great teacher somewhere in your life. Somebody helped to create this unbelievable American system that we have that, 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 we have, that allowed you to thrive. Somebody invested in roads and bridges. If you've got a business, you didn't build that. Somebody else made that happen. The internet didn't get invented on its own. Government research created the internet so that all the companies could make money off the internet. The point is, is that when we succeed, we succeed because of our individual initiative, but also because we do things together. I might disagree with Obama's summary of internet history, and as a politician, I suspect President Obama found it hard to give airtime to other citizens who helped us, civic organizations, churches, what have you. But he is right to point out that we are members who benefit from the semi-coercive community of government. In an insightful piece in the FT, John Kay summarizes why we should back long-term welfare and benefit investment. He invokes Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative to explain why we should look after those who no longer do anything for us, particularly the old. He says, it would be good for everyone, including ourselves when we are old, if everyone acted this way. He points out that the social contract can either be met by using money as a store of value, such that future generations recognize today's generation's financial claims, invoking Paul Samuelson's phrase, the social contrivance of money, or we can meet the social contract by implementing a social security system. Both these types of social arrangement can fail and often have done. Inflation can prevent money acting as a store of value, or the social contract can be reneged on through an announcement that previously understood commitments are now unaffordable. Both debasement and default benefit a current generation at the expense of its predecessors and successors. And there are more radical moves, such as outright seizure of property or enslavement. Long-term, big and dispersed decisions are tough. An example would be a nuclear power plant. Long in time, at the top end of the construction scale, and the effects are spread through the national grid. Other tough decisions are pensions, mortgages, and long-term insurance. The state may have its problems, but it's the dominant game in town for long-term choices. Dieter Helm and others are promoting intergenerational sustainability, the concept that the state should arrange matters so that future generations are no worse off than current ones. Finding the germ of a new way of thinking about the role of the state. It is the guarantor of the provision of the core public goods through time. And these are provided largely by the private sector under long-term contracts, which honor the investments provided they are efficiently made. So we've had an evening looking at the ways in which government can finance things. We've built a framework that I hope shows you just some of the rich ways in which government finance can be used to achieve outcomes. John Coleman said, the point to remember is that what the government gives, it must first take away. I hope you realize that while he may be right, a fiat currency system can hide the takings, while some of the other mechanisms, such as reinsurance, try to make a good fist of the situation we're already in. There are a lot of extreme arguments about government, but I find three particularly troublesome. 
The first is government should do everything, leading to government should or does own everything and making us and the world chattels of some state. The second is an excessive idea of fairness. Everything should be fair, leading to denying that inequality motivates, as well as justifying retrospective seizures of property. I would love the time to explore luck egalitarianism as a way between equality of outcome and equality of opportunity. In this concept, social justice is present when variations in people's circumstances are down to choices they made, while chance variations are compensated. And the third disturbing argument is that all important decisions should have state oversight. There's a lot of talk about democratic deficits, which ignores the fact that we have a representative democracy, not a direct democracy, and further implies that we should instantaneously react to changes in public opinion. I was troubled earlier this year at Gresham College when John Berko, the Speaker of the House, in an otherwise wonderful speech, felt proud that urgent questions in Parliament had risen from, under, from around two per annum to 99 over his three years. Do we want a parliament that feels it has to react instantaneously to all major events? Well, I'll end on a final disturbing contrast between two opposing schools. One argues that the role of government is to allow the private sector to flourish, while another argues that the role of the private sector is to fund the public sector. In these times of financial crisis, your choice of school is fundamental. It's not simple, and we haven't been able to explore it all. So I suggest keeping those acting roles in mind. The state is benefactor, enterprise, guarantor, investor, or sorcerer's apprentice. Which role did you have in mind when you suggested the government should do something? Winston Churchill said, the best argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. I hope that after tonight, you could give him a different five-minute experience. And I'll leave the last word to Thomas Jefferson. I predict future happiness for Americans if they can prevent the government from wasting the labors of the people under the pretense of taking care of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, apologies for being late. Um, but uh, the half hour that I did get was quite exceptional. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just ask your, your view on one point. Um, because you talk about um, you know, the view that the government needs to pick up everything or the government feels that uh, to a large degree uh, it has to assume the ultimate, uh, ultimate risk or ultimate responsibility. Um, we've seen over time that um, when we had the Secretary of State for DTI brought in the uh, insurance side that we became the insurer of, the, of last resort. We've subsequently seen obviously the TARP being brought in and we've seen uh, the bailouts of the banks. Um, my question is, in your opinion, would government, government finance in all the different categories be stronger if we used the Darwinian philosophy of letting certain things die? Okay. Other hands? Uh, hello, good evening. Um, I'm not an English speaker by, by birth. So, uh, uh, the question is regarding um, this kind of two philosophies uh, and uh, well in in the aftermath of of this financial crisis or with the aftermath of, of this financial crisis um, isn't it uh, um, don't we see uh, the birth of a third way uh, if you like and if that it's so um, how you connect that one with the democratic deficit as well as um, failure of the neoliberal capitalism. Thank you. Gentleman here. What should uh, uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer say in his autumn statement applying your principles? Good one. <laughs> and uh, last, last comment up here. In your tax solemnly of the roles of government, the, um, the category service delivery, there's, there's a lot of debate as to not just what should be done, but how it should be done in terms of whether it is, and particularly in things like health and education, as the actual role of the state in actually providing the services as opposed to commissioning them. To what extent do you think there's a similar debate on how 
which applies to the other categories you, you identified as the rather than, 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 than the what? That's a, that's a good, good, tough question. All right, so a few things here. Um, the, the notion of Darwinianism, uh, is there a third way evolving? Uh, what should the chance announce? And uh, do we have other debates on the how mechanisms in, in, the, other, in the other categories? Um, I'm afraid I, I'm not sure that I can justify uh, Darwinian approaches except simply on kind of empirical research, which is that Darwinian approaches work. I, I've always found it uh, really peculiar that in the public sector, and I know your question's about banking, I want to come back to that, um, that people sort of take the one thing that motivates everybody elsewhere and say it doesn't apply here. <laughs> Um, and I find it frightening that we're removing that from banking. So I've written uh, quite a bit on uh, the road to long finance, uh, and the thesis behind that was that one of the biggest failures has been in the debate about what we're doing in terms of reforming the financial system. We seem to always be pushing more competition off to the side, and I think if you go back to Adam Smith in terms of open competitive markets, that should be at the core. So uh, under long finance, we have a number of proposals for things like insured utility banks and all which address that. In terms of the third way, uh, you know, you know, I'm not sure that neoclassical uh, capitalism has failed. I, I think we come on to the thing, it, you know, it would be a good thing if it was ever tried. Um, I, I, and this comes back, I think, to the competition. But when you look at the areas that have failed, they're almost always characterized by an oligopoly or a, a failure of competition. Um, so I would look at things like the banking markets. Well, they didn't fail across the world. There's 2,000 banks in Germany. They're doing fine, thank you very much. Eight to 9,000 retail banks in America. But where we saw failures, we had AIG, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac as a concentrated housing one, 12 global investment banks controlling uh, over 20% of the global investment banking industry. Uh, Britain, Ireland, and Iceland, where three, four, and five banks controlled 80% plus of the economy. So you, you know, these, these were the things to me. So I think we're, we're going to keep seeing this debate moving, um, and I'm afraid I've I'll run out of time if I go on uh, much longer, but I think it's a good question, um, and I welcome any thoughts on where that evolution might go. As far as the Chancellor's statement, well, so far as I'm concerned, I think I've laid out a couple of things I'd love to see, particularly on climate change. I'd like to see him say, well, we're going to link some of our bonds to our performance targets. I'd like to see him, if Britain is going to be such a cyber-free nation, well, why don't we in induce reinsurance? I think I've made some suggestions in that category. Um, and then I think the rest of it then becomes political. Um, but you can see that I, I feel that the scale of the state sector is out of control and that the Sorcerer's Apprentice is reaching dangerous levels. That's not really quite what tonight was about. It was about trying to lay out this taxonomy, but, uh, but it's there. And, and finally, um, in terms of debates about the hows in some of the other sectors, I think one of the things I was trying to achieve tonight was to paint. There's a lot of other things and just get the money in and spend it. That was what I was trying to do. I'd like to see a lot more debate uh, about the how, the, the, the other methods. In terms of how these things um, are actually managed, yes, there's, there's still quite a bit of debate there as well. Um, you know, what, uh, how should a reinsurer be, be, be constructed? Uh, how much, uh, I, I mentioned hypothecation, people still debate whether or not hypothecation should be, uh, should be a mechanism. Should people have individual accounts? Is there competition in uh, the sector between that? So I think there's a huge host of ways in which you can implement any of these 12 uh, outcomes differently, um, and I, I welcome that over drinks. Well, I hope that gave you a tenor of how people were feeling tonight. Um, I don't mean to keep you from, from the wine bar, or me for that matter. Uh, please do fill in your evaluation forms, and I'd like to thank you so much for coming tonight and listening to some of uh, my thoughts on risk equality and opportunity, the roles of government finance. Thank you.